Mama Cecilia Kazamira is a, a lady known in Malawi as Mama. She was born in Yasaland but brought up in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. She was brought up in a Christian family, which had lots of good values. Up to the age of maybe 18, when she came back home to Nyasaland, which is now Malawi. My father and mother, when I looked at them, I was amazed. We were seven children in Rhodesia. Two were with the grandparents here, so they had nine children all together. And those seven, my father managed to educate them, all of us. So when they went into secondary school, the last four, I was a nurse, my sister was a nurse, my elder brother was a carpenter, cabinet maker. So we said, these four we must take over. My father had sent all of them to New Zealand. So each one was collecting a bit. Each one would pay for that one, pay for that one, pay for, for that one. They all went into secondary school, two into high school. Now one is a professor, the other is a master's in social sciences, the other one has a degree in uh, business studies, and uh, the other one was a teacher, but she's late now. So I always say it's the way I was brought up or we were brought up to be united, to love each other. And then appreciate your parents, no matter what they did to you, they are your parents. That is the next God for us. So that was one area where I thought I should mention about my bringing up. My exposure of being raised in Rhodesia, where I had the privilege of self-development under the comfort of modern civilization of that time. I know a bit of self-development housekeeping, cooking, laundry, and also worshiping, gardening, and handicrafts. So I was able to join women together in the state residences where I was working and start classes for them in this uh, particular field. On top of that, we had an organization of women called CCAM, or Chitukuko Chamai, or Women in Development in Malawi, which was uh, formed in 1984 up to 1994 or 95, when the government changed to a multi-party system. The one-party system had advantages. We could bring all the women of all races in Malawi together and do programs and projects, you know, to develop the country, to work with the communities, particularly the elderly people and the needy people, by opening fields, helping them um, construct little houses or huts in the village for old women. And there would be groups of women collecting firewood, place them in the old woman's house for her to be helped, not going to the forest for firewood. Some would help in carrying water every now and then. So that one was the one I was really interested in. And then agriculture, growing of food. You know, staple food in Malawi is maize. In the north it's cassava. Somewhere in between, in north as well as central and southern region, rice. But everywhere in the country, we grow maize. So there was a time where women organization, SCAM, could produce so much, even for sale. 
So we're able to raise funds to help with development here and there. That is one privilege I had of working with women all over the country. I think she has had an impact on a, a, a larger amount of women in Malawi through the CCM yeah, and um, as well as the dressing. You know, throughout her work, when she was working as an official government hostess, she, uh, the type of dressing that she was, you know, show, showcasing, quite a lot of women learned from that as well. You know, like the traditional dressing. Yeah. And I remember some, some of my friends were used to ask me, where does she have all her clothes made from? And the clothes, and the, I mean, the materials that she, you know, she uses for her attires. Yeah, so yeah, I think she had an impact on the women as well. Both dressing and um, self-sufficiency. Why exactly did I choose to be educated in my life? I would say I decided in the end to be trained as a nurse. And I started with midwifery in Rhodesia. I qualified that. And where we were training, it was on a hill. Beautiful scenery when you go up there. They built this hospital just on top of the hill. And you could see the trees, some of the trees had flowers. And there was lots of forest where you could walk in, see the animals and so on. But there were no wild animals, there were just kudus and little rabbits and so on. So I trained there for two years, qualified, and I came home. But as I was training, I made sure that I could continue with my secondary education because my father could not afford the, some of the children, like the three, uh, three of us who were older. So we had to live on standard six, which is eight here. So I continued trusting, uh, studying to go into high school or secondary and high school. And two years was not enough. But during that time, I knew I could apply for further nursing training as general nurse. And uh, they were to take me in McCordy Hospital, McCords in South Africa. It was called McCords Zulu Hospital for Africans, of course. But when my father heard, he said, uh -uh, I'm going home. Why, father? You have to go home, get some job there, and help develop that country. We are still very far. So I was regretting that I came home, yes. And when I came home, I first worked at a mission hospital in Cheo, in Paramount Chief Gomani's area for five months. Then I went to Zomba to join General Hospital for general training. I learned a lot from the first president of Malawi. His leadership soon after independence his values and the passion to develop the country and bring better standards of living for the people in all walks of life. This was typical of Dr. Banda. He brought in unity in the country. There was no, you come from the north. No, I can't deal with you. You come from the south. No, you can't work with me. You come from the center. No, I can't dance or sing with you. He wanted everybody to integrate. And uh, this was more uh, noticed when we formed the women organization, CCAM in development. It was everybody from the north, south, and so on. 
and also at independence there was the ruling party in the ruling party there were three groups the main party of the congress then the women's league of the congress then the youth league so women were encouraged to show their traditional dances to show their culture by visiting each other and women you know are very keen on dancing and singing so women from the north will come to functions in the center women from the north and south and center will go to functions for women in the south particularly on celebration days like independence day republic day youth day and so on so that dr banda saw to it that there should be unity in the country and as i'm speaking today because of that uh, value he had of unity there was never a war in this country between races no other countries will be fighting amongst themselves but here never and uh, when there are problems here i always pray they should not be fighting or killing they should always be you know contact and dialogue which dr banda believed because leaders in africa in the early years did not want to interact with the boer who is an africana and an apartheid people they didn't want to interact with portuguese because portuguese were very cruel they had this mbarachanda thing so dr banda said in order to know a person even if he's your enemy you have to go and talk to him and see why is he an enemy so i'm urging you african leaders fellow african leaders to believe in contact and dialogue so some in the end did believe in that but it was quite a, a task for dr banda to convince some of the african leaders and by talking to south africa i remember it was 1970 when the prime minister of south africa came to malawi dr foster i remember i took him to the mountain zomba mountain to see the scenery from zomba of the chire river the mulanje mountain and the you know the tea plantations and so on and he was talking to we africans quite freely there was nothing sinister about it and he ate at the table with dr banda and his ministers he went later on the president of south africa came i took them to the farms in kasungu and also to mtuntama house we had lunch with the Africans and so on and South Africans were best here and in turn Dr Banda paid a state visit to South Africa and there he made a speech at Stellenbosch a university which is the the main whatever you call it the main is it harbor for Africans the real hard core and he made a speech there which is played even up to now a speech called i have not changed because people said you are going there so you have changed you are a white man in a black skin and he said i am dr banda the african in my heart i have no skin i don't say this is white skin or black skin i'm neutral and i come here to ask you people here don't look down on africans they are human beings i need contact and dialogue with you people how can my people work in south africa with these conditions you impose because you know many people in malawi or in yasaland used to go in the mines to work in the mines in the southern in the south africa 
And some went to Rhodesia to work on the farms because there were big farms there. And Dr. Banda said, if I boycott them, what will happen to my people here and in southern Rhodesia? No, I'm not going to boycott them. I'll talk to them. I'll listen to their problems. They should listen to mine. So that was the best basic of that speech. I have not changed. Oh, it was well received. So in hospital, even the white sisters could be friendly with the blacks. Like my sister Lucy, who was a, a staff nurse then. She was very friendly with the, a sister Conde from Scotland. Yes. So the experience with Dr. Kisler hurt me a lot. That's why I said I had to leave. But she left herself. <laughs> I think it was believed for a long time that the people who had differed with Dr. Banda in politics and were either killed or went into exile it was a common belief that it was Mama that would instigate that kind of um, action. And I vividly remember people believing that it was Mama's values of not putting on miniskirts um, because how would Dr. Banda feel anything about miniskirts? And so basically they thought that Dr. Banda was a nice person but Mama and her family were the villains. And so now knowing her more and having read about the history of Malawi, I realized actually that, you know, common sense would say this lady was raised in Zimbabwe and in Rhodesia in those days. And miniskates were the order of the day. And she wore miniskates herself in her time. So there's no way she would have come up with the idea of let's have miniskirts. I mean, we shouldn't have miniskirts in Malawi. But it was actually Dr. Banda whose values um, and the, the love of culture that were behind these ideas, at least of the miniskirts. So I think it boils down to when you don't know somebody, when you don't know people, you create stories, imaginations based on your perception <laughs> and as a life coach I know that everyone's perception is unique and everyone has a different story so if I decide today to say you know Fiona is this person unless I challenge myself with a different view I can live my whole life be believing that Fiona is this which may be correct or may be totally different because everybody is um, vision of the world is different and so I think now I know that we should really be careful with what we think we know about each other unless we really get closer we should not make a statements. I've enrolled in a class for coaching it's a method of helping people to find their true and authentic selves, as well as solve any problem in life. When this works, you can solve any problem that comes in your way and it's common to human life. Just a short explanation of what coaching means. It's like hospital work but it does more with the mind, mind behavior and so on. The passion I had was if the <laughs> If the rainy season was poor that year, and I would make just a little profit or loss, I would give up. I'm not going to do it anymore. Please give it to someone else to lease. 
But once the rain comes, I look at the ground, I will rush to the farm. <laughs> it's wet. When it's wet, you know what to do. We start you know, tilling the soil, plowing, make lines, make ridges, and then plant. You know, growing of crops is like godly nature. You become like God, you know, creating these things. You see them grow, fertilize them, you fertilize them and weed. And I always admired, my farm was about 1,000 hectares. I could stand at a high place, look lower down to see the leaves of tobacco. Then maize there. You know maize shines when there's a little wind. From the horizon, you couldn't help, you know, saying, God, thank you very much. So that was my passion in farming. It didn't do any harm to me. But now it's a bit uh, too much. So I've handed over to nieces and nephews the past five years who are doing very well. I remain as an advisor, of course. <laughs> Throughout my life, she's been a, like a, a model to me because of the work she was doing. And I think my, uh, my future was really based on how she, you know, uh, was teaching us um, good values, you know, even at work, that we should work hard. And um, I believe I've been successful in my work life because of the advice that she had been giving us since I was young. She's a very loving person and um, she would like people to learn you know, to respect. She has taught us how to respect the elders. And um, as I said, they, they had working. Um, I think that has uh, brought a, a very big impact on me as well. I think I would describe Mama in two parts. One, there is the, the public figure that we know as Mama. So even when you're close to Mama, it's very difficult to not see her as this shining icon because the shining icon is not just a public figure. The shining icon is who she is, truly. And when you hear stories of her before she became state hostess, you'll understand that she had a certain feeling of self a certain dignity about her where she did not let certain things um, happen to her. She told a story of how one Hungarian doctor shouted at her and used um, words that were not so kind, words that were quite racist. And at that time she said, okay, I might as well leave this place and find another work somewhere else. She was not official hostess then, she was a nurse, but she had a sense of dignity within herself. She had a sense of grace within herself. So Mama was not made by a certain position. She brought herself to that position and elevated it to what it, to what it was or what it is. And so being friends with Mama, you will, always have that sense of this icon, this, this person that is just so amazing, you know. And then on the personal side where, you know, it's not so much this lady who has a Victorian living room, you know, this lady that I'm in the kitchen with, cooking with, is that um, I find her to be quite a gentle soul. I think what I really know about Mama is that she's very thoughtful towards other people and very kind. And it doesn't matter who the person is. When there are people working here, she makes sure that everybody is fed. She will cook for them herself. If she's not in a position to do that, she will send for food. She will always make sure that 
people are working and they're fed and they're okay. Malawi's visit was rated uh, the best by the British press because from the airport everything was mesmerizing. You know, um, I remember watching it on TV when I was in England as a student. Um, I think the Queen had the most beautiful visit. And I believe they've asked her that uh, which are the best countries you have visited and she mentioned that Malawi is one of them. Others uh, got one out of ten, two out of two, but Malawi got nine out of ten, ten out of ten, because of the way they organized. And this is the woman who did it. So we used to ask ourselves that would people ever think Mama in Malawi? Because we've seen the work she's done, the dedication, the passion she had, uh, because Ngwazi wanted high class things, and she, 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 I don't know where she learned it from. Whether it's natural, it just came to her naturally. And um, they went through a lot, a lot of stress, a lot of depressions, but they carried themselves with her sister, you know, with love and dedication. My dream is a big one. <laughs> I pray for peace in my country. I pray for, I've got a hope, and I pray for that hope. Prosperity, economic viability. And I pray that this chronic disease of corruption should go down and be eradicated. And uh, this corruption, you know, is mainly the taxpayer who suffers. Everybody in this country who is working, who is making something, has to pay tax. And if you see some of these people who pay tax, they are as poor as a church mouse, but they pay the tax. And then those who are in upper echelons, they take that money and use it for themselves. That is terrible. It is really unkind to people. So those are my hopes and prayer for peace in the country, honesty, integrity. <laughs>